This with Life 180, and today I am here with my buddy Matt Seibert, who uh, is been bringing a lot of things to my attention lately, and uh, he's really good at keeping his finger on the pulse as I've been going through my my move and my transition, all these different things. Uh, still running Life 180, doing all these uh, all the things that I do. Uh, he's been kind of keeping his finger on the pulse with all the shenanigans going on 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 social media regarding whole life insurance, index universal life, infinite banking concept, all this stuff. And he actually sent me something this week that made my head spin. I haven't even gotten into it completely. Uh, and we thought maybe today we'd, we'd hop on here and we're just going to have a conversation about it. So Matt, what do you want to say before we get into this stuff? Well, I think we, um, we need to do a better job getting the word out there uh, faster and louder um, because of uh, the, the false beliefs, the half truths, the things that people are believing and saying are so off base. And, um, I just want to be able to go out and educate people further and, and allow them to see clearly. <laughs> so we, we need to make some more, more noise, Chris, cause obviously it's not working. Uh, if you look at a lot of the forums, there's a lot of forums on Facebook. And uh, I think the latest thing is a lot of new agents, uh, they come across IULs, they hear something about it. Obviously you hear the typical upside, no downside, and then they're automatically sold without doing any research on it. And if you see a lot of these posts and people, uh, their opinions, um, and, um, their advice as far as IULs, uh, it's, it's kind of scary to be honest. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's so far yeah. off. Um, and there's just no, there's no accountability. And I think, you know, when I first started selling IULs like 10 years ago, um, there was a sense of accountability to a certain degree. Like, you know, we can't say certain things and stuff like that, but right now it's like the wild, wild West, the things that are sold are just like off the wall. Um, and so I think we just need to do a better job. Um, we need to maybe do more videos. <laughs> you're, you are leading the, the front. Yeah. You're leading from the front in the whole industry, but I think we need to develop more yeah. and, and do more. So I already get too much, too much crap from people that tell me I, I spend too much time talking about IUL, you know? Well, if we look at the Google trend, if you look up IUL, it, it's significantly, it's exploding. And mm -hmm. the reality is you have agents that sold IUL for like two months and now they're an expert. Right. Yeah, um, and they haven't even seen the long term. Most IUL agents that I combat and challenge, I ask them, how long have you been selling IULs? It's probably under three years. And so That's, they haven't even seen, yeah. they haven't even seen yeah. what the I account know. can do and, and what the carriers can change. It's, and they're, they're relying on just the illustration as if, I mean, even if you read the illustration, you, you know, mm -hmm. that all, all it's, everything's like a facade and everything could be changed. And, um, you know, it's when the, when you believe in something strongly, it's, it's kind of hard to open their mind. And, yeah. um, you know, when I, when I tell people my journey, when I, that day you came to my office, mm -hmm. that was the last day I sold out well. And I, I'm actually shocked. I thought most people would actually, once you see it, you'd be like, okay, obviously that we, we need to look at different avenues. And I'm just really shocked why people are just not open to it. And it's crazy. Yeah, I mean, it's nuts because um, people hold on to things uh, because uh, acknowledging that there's a problem with it uh, means there's probably going to be some sort of financial pain for the people that have to acknowledge that because they're going to lose commissions, they're going to lose their ability to earn an income or sell the same way, and they're going to have to go out and learn a new skill and learn how to mm -hmm. sell differently and, and serve people differently and all these different things. That you, you hit the nail on the head, though. Here's the deal. Like, all the people... There's, there's a handful of guys uh, that have been doing this business long enough that are selling IUL that I think if you look at the people, uh, well, okay, let me let me start this over. I'm going to start this statement over because I, I had to reconcile all my thoughts in my head. Everything just kind of comes out really quickly. So when I think about the influencers doing this, okay, um, the people really leading the charge on the IUL space um, and educating people. You have uh, Doug Andrew, David McKnight, and Curtis Ray. Those are the three biggest IUL names in the business, making the biggest impact, positive or negative, uh, in the IUL space. Out of those people, I encourage everybody to go search out Doug Andrew's lawsuit 
in Doug Andrew lawsuit and, and just do your own research and figure it out. And if you still believe he's the guy for you to follow uh, and his strategies are locked and loaded, solid, ironclad, whatever you want to call it, uh, you, you just do your research and you realize like the trouble the guy's been in. And, and if he's so good at what he does, he wouldn't have had that many problems legally. Like that's all I can say. He's not doing anything different now than he was then. He puts out videos. You know, I did the IUL challenge. And he, he's created a, a playlist that's supposedly proved me wrong. Uh, you know, but at the end of the day, this playlist doesn't mean crap to me uh, because an IUL can work. And if you've sold thousands of policies, you know, you should have 20, 30, 40 policies that have that have worked just by default, like just because certain times some things just line up, uh, you know. But once again, I, I, I did an interview uh, with Devin Byrne, I was talking about this concept of like, if you're going to, if you, if you were to get on an airplane and they told you that the airplane had a 10% chance of, of succeeding, uh, would you, would you stay on that airplane? And the answer is no, everybody would get off that airplane. And so, um, that's about, you know, the situation with IUL, you know, I would say it's even worse than 10%, but like, I'm just trying to be generous here. And so, um, historically speaking, you know, you got Doug Andrew, uh, who, who's the number one trainer for IUL in the world right now. And his uh, track record, if you just Google him, is abysmal. Um, you know, it, that that part's bad. David McKnight um, is is a bit of a different animal. I think David McKnight, out of all of the, all the IUL people, is probably the best. Um, that said, I don't agree uh, with him. And I think it's just pathetic that he just won't get it, get online and have a debate with me uh, and have a conversation about this. Um, I do like that David McKnight is not all about leaning solely on IUL uh, and that he leverages other assets. And I understand uh, his premise. I, I think he misses the ball on a lot of things, but that's, that's just neither here nor there, I guess, for this conversation. Um, Curtis Ray. Uh, so, so those, uh, let me say this before I go any further. Doug Andrew and David McKnight are the only two that have been in this business long enough to even have history of success. Um, David McKnight won't show uh, illustrations uh, from a long time ago, which tells me that there's a problem there. Doug Andrew has shown a couple, uh, and show, but like that doesn't mean that anything has been proven wrong. I think a lot of people think I created the IUL challenge uh, because I was coming from this position like it was impossible for IUL to work. Uh, when IUL can work in a vacuum and a small percentage of the time it will, I just simply say IUL is not a predictable result. And that's, that's that. Now these, there's this new wave of people because of the fact that Doug Andrew has these training contracts with world financial group. You and I went to this event and Doug Andrew was like the lead trainer for like 700 IUL agents that were there, right. With world financial group. And, uh, and, and that's what he does. That's his business model. He goes around and teaches these IMOs, all, and sells his courses. And he's like the guru teaching all these uh, IUL agents how to sell. Yet you look at his results, like I said, and he's he's had so many legal problems and, and issues. Yet these people seem to just think that those don't matter. Those legal issues don't matter. And, and like and 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 then you have this new wave of of influencers coming on board that are new to the business, but they're really good at marketing. They're really good at, at misrepresentation of what these products are really designed to do. And the insurance companies are complicit in the problem as well because they've uh, positioned themselves and, and, and allowed for these agents to misrepresent the marketing. Mutual of Omaha is the worst of the group uh, in allowing Curtis Ray to go out and do his MPI garbage with the relock feature uh, in everything I think Mutual of Omaha, my, my opinion, is going to get in a lot of trouble at some point in time here when, when the wheels come off. Um, but here's the challenge. Whether it's Curtis Ray, whether it's these influencers like Brian Jarrell now, and, and you know I don't know if he's watching right now live. Sometimes he's on our live streams. I'll open the chats. Brian, hop in if you want to chat. Um, Brian uh, you know, is, has been in the business since like 2019. You've got all these guys that have been in the business now that, you know, They've barely taken 10 breaths in the business and all of a sudden they're experts and they have no real historical experience uh, in, in the business. And because they've seen 10 videos with Doug Andrew using uh, illustrations that aren't even the full illustrations they're just like little snapshots of illustrations trying to prove out like that it works without even having the full conversation about what the purpose of these policies should be, what the risk 
uh, of these policies actually is. And they're trying to position them like they're these ironclad, uh, you know, contracts that are going to that are going to insulate you from risk in in retirement. And they're going to get you this predictable result and nothing could be further from the truth. And there's going to be a wave of problems, I think, in the IUL space. Um, and, and most of that is because of the fact that you got a bunch of these people that are that are so far in over their heads. And, and it's easy to sell an IUL based on an illustration. It's easy to misrepresent. It's easy to fall into the misrepresentation of IULs, uh, you know, and I'll say this, I'll say this. If, if you are an IUL agent and you're selling IUL, obviously, and you've never read the entire contract line for line of the product you're selling, you have no right to be selling that product. Uh, furthermore, if you go through and you're selling the IUL as this predictable vehicle that's going to achieve a predictable result for your clients, and you're selling on upside protection, upside potential, downside protection, and all these different things, and you read the contract and you continue to sell it the way that most people online are selling it, you have a, uh, I, a an ethical challenge ahead of you, right? Like I, I will, I will say that you, uh, are ethically challenged because you're misrepresenting the spirit and nature of the product as a whole. Um, you know, when when the story of upside potential in IUL was created, upside potential, downside protection, it wasn't upside potential due to market, uh, due to the uncapped nature of the markets and the indexes and things like that. It was because of the fact that you have upside potential compared to a traditional universal life product. If you strip away the indexed uh, indexing component of an IUL, you simply have a universal life product. If you use like a lot of these people that are like, I love IUL because it's a it's an index strategy, which, you know, whole life is a fixed product. Whole life is a fixed product. IUL is an index product. So we like IUL more is what people are saying because of the fact that if the index is bad or if the market goes bad, we could just shift to the fixed index strategy of the IUL, which, by the way, if you do that, it's a traditional UL at that point in time. And if you've looked at the history of traditional ULs, it's not very pretty, right? Um, it's, it's actually pretty horrible. Sean Gavin says IULs are all smoke and mirrors, uh, just, like an, just like an illusion, right? And that is, that is so true. Um, you know, I think... I, I don't know. I look. I look at this, and I think where where it's gotten really, really bad um, is in the in the in the use case of index universal life uh, being utilized for infinite banking. And um, Nelson Nash would be rolling over his, in his grave right now if he knew this. Um, and you sent me something um, the other day, uh, and I haven't gotten into it a lot, but you found a Facebook group, and this Facebook group has over one hundred twenty thousand members, right? And I'm going to share it here. Um, and uh, let me see here. I'm going to I'm going to go here. Can you see my screen? OK. Now we can. Yeah. OK. So you can see life insurance agents. What is the name of this group? Uh, it was like, let's have a talk about. Infinite banking concept, but it's a life insurance agents group. Uh, can we have a discussion about the IBC concept? For starters, the original IBC was with whole life using paid up additions riders. The new IBC, there is no new IBC. IBC <laughs> is IBC. There is no new IBC. You're not evolutionary. You're not, you know, like evolving this, this concept into a better thing. You lose all ability uh, you know, uh, for banking when you inject the level of risk that's involved. The, well, uh, let me let me read these and I, I'm going to read the comments. I'm just like for full transparency, Matt, you I, you know, we were talking about this before. I didn't even get into this. So I'm, I'm very no. curious to get into uh, reading all the comments and breaking them down. OK, true reaction video. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a reaction video. Let's do it that way. OK, the new IBC is overfunded IUL, which I prefer. He says the concept works with both. However, whole life is for guarantees. Why IUL is for growth and flexibility of premiums. Too many newer agents aren't being trained, aren't being properly trained and doing harm to people while trying to do a noble thing. All right, let's uh, 
Let's 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 get into these comments and see what's up. Nope. <laughs> All right, here we go. Uh, let's see if oh man, there's a lot of comments in here. Let me uh, I'm going to just try to open some up here and we'll uh, I saw Brian Gerald in there. All right. So here we go. Giddy up. <laughs> it's game time. All right. Riley Hinton said, nope. Do you know what a non-direct recognition loan is? Is uh, is there an IUL with this feature? Uh, yes, there is a non-direct recognition loan uh, is, is basically saying when you take a loan against a policy, it's not direct. It's the company does not directly recognize that loan and lower, uh, the dividend performance for the equivalent, uh, loan amount in in the policy for the cash value in the policy. So a, uh, when you, when you have, um, IULs, you have either participating loans or non-participating loans, uh, or you could have an index loan or a fixed loan. They call them different things. Every company works differently, but they have the same thing as where, but, but the difference with an IUL is that if you do an index loan, uh, then what happens is if the market does poorly, you actually pick up a lot more exposure and risk. And that is one of the biggest problems of utilizing IULs for loans in retirement in general. Take infinite banking away. Uh, the index loans, which are going to make it so the IUL illustrates better because they always illustrate with 50 basis points of positive arbitrage every single year with no down years. If you inject uh, the fact is that we're going to have negative years or the market is going to perform worse than the loan costs at least 35% of the time historically. And if you you look at the illustration and there's no down years and we replace 35% of those years with flat years and then you see what it does to the policy, it will make your policy implode. It, it, I, I always say your policy folds faster than our origami, you know, when you're in retirement, when that happens, because it is it is that bad, right? So, all right. So uh, he's asking, is there an IUL with that feature? Yeah, I mean, there is. Is that, uh, that is one important aspect that makes it work in the first place. So I would say this Riley Henton guy actually maybe doesn't even fully get it. So these are apples and oranges. There is a reason IUL doesn't work well for this. And I write plenty of IULs. Okay, so he writes IULs. He At least he agrees IULs are not uh, for IBC. Also, having forecastable growth helps uh, plan for IBC. That part is true. Another important aspect of why uh, it works so well for IBC, I assume he means by it, he means whole life. Um, so here's what I'd say to this. Um, you, I, Based on how Riley's talking about it, he's he's uh, when, whenever you have the, you need to use a, a non-direct recognition company for IBC, uh, you're, I assume, talking about the potential of positive arbitrage, and that's the reason you need the non-direct recognition company, and that's not even true. Um, and this guy's got 20 replies to this uh, to this response. I'm I'm kind of curious to to see what happens. Um, so Michael says, yes, we now have IUL carriers that allow compound growth to continue uninterrupted uh, when equity is collateralized. Uh, we have IUL carriers that allow compound growth to, no, you don't, you don't <laughs> No, you do not have, uh, the ability to uninterrupt compound growth in an IUL when you utilize, uh, an index loan, you potentially can earn more and have positive arbitrage, but on a negative year, you're still going to have a loan expense and that's going to, uh, add to inefficiencies in the policy. And when you're older, that can lead to a lot of problems. Uh, it's not going to bother you so much if you're utilizing it when you're in your 30s, 40s, 50s, uh, and you're you're taking loans, paying them back and stuff of that nature. But when you're u- doing that and you run into that issue for retirement income, that's where the problem comes in. Uh, Michael Novosel, uh, that's awesome, but it doesn't work even remotely as soon as par whole life. They're not the same. Okay, not even close. At least he's true. Uh, how many loans at a time does it allow? What? Still apples and oranges. Any shot in the dark? Uh, no. So, okay. So, man, it is painful for me to read these comments, by the way. <laughs> this is just like... This, uh, blind okay. leading the blind. Okay, Michael no- Novacell, you can collateralize an IUL immediately. Okay, so it may be riskier, though, considering market timing and sequence of returns. Uh, I mean... You can collateralize technically IUL immediately if you have an agent that did a loan or did a, a policy design, policy structure that utilizes um, 
uh, like uh, commission uh, that that waives all the commission, um, commissionable premium and all that stuff and uh, surrender charge waivers and all that, uh, those those options and, and it can work. Um, but if you do the rider that waives the surrender charges, it comes at a cost. Uh, that will make the policy perform worse from a long-term perspective. And so you just got to realize uh, from an apples to apples conversation, uh, whole life is just a more pure option as far as this goes. I'm just going to skim through these because I don't know that this, I don't think this back and forth uh, is going to work. All right, Brian Gerald, I got, I got to read this guy's comment. Here we go. Oh, <laughs> cool. Ryan says, Riley Henton, you're incorrect on this one. Index loans allow the loan to come out as a double ledger system just like a non-direct recognition loan okay i don't know double ledger um but let's see for example if you have a hundred thousand in cash okay i see what he's saying if you have a hundred thousand in cash value you can pull fifty thousand out it becomes a double ledger system which means the hundred thousand is still there compounding at full uh while the fifty thousand loan is also compounding yeah okay so you assume getting seven percent. So assuming you have seven percent this year, that's a big assumption, Brian. Uh, the cash value growth would be one hundred seven thousand minus any cost of insurance fees. Blah 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 blah. Uh, loan would be compounded five percent, which means uh, the loan would be fifty two thousand five hundred. But here's the deal: he talks about that in a positive sense. But if the if the growth is zero, let's say the index did zero, then what happens is uh, your your cash value grows to nothing. Um, you, you don't have any growth at all and you still pick up this additional expense. That is the problem. IUL can absolutely work as an IBC concept, he says. Uh, I have a policy of four years. Uh, I got news for you. If you're thinking <laughs> it can be done after four years, that tells me you don't understand the long-term concept of infinite banking concepts. I've taken loans against it twice, good for you. If you take loans against it when you're early in the policy, as long as you're managing those loans and paying them back, you're not going to run into any issues, but it doesn't mean from a long-term perspective, it works. Okay. Uh, first year, my loan rate was 2.91% while I earned 13.25%. Okay. That is not infinite banking. Infinite banking is not about the damn arbitrage. I wish people would smarten the hell up. And that is not what it's about. And if you're talking about the fact that uh, th well, I I'll tell you right now, Brian is talking about, uh, this concept that he made more than he, than he arbitrage. That is not what infinite banking is about. That is, that is not like I'm, I I've done so many videos on this and it's so frustrating that these <laughs> people are just focusing on the positive arbitrage. It is a potential function. Sure. But that is not the purpose. They're taking one little feature of an entire concept and they're selling this feature like it's the entire concept. And that is the problem with all these IUL people not understanding. I swear, like it's mind numbing to me. And I <laughs> so swear if, these people have never read the book. I swear if, like it's- If like, there was I, a year, there was no positive arbitrage, then does that mean it's not infinite banking in an IUL? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like if there's, there's no positive arbitrage, not only do you not have positive arbitrage in this situation, like he's talking about this, this one year with, this hundred seven thousand dollars in a year where that's flat. Well, now you have a hundred thousand, not a hundred seven thousand. You picked up the uh, the extra. Um, you picked up the extra interest expense, which is obviously a negative. And because the interest expense went higher, your cost of insurance is going to go up. You know, your net amount at risk is higher, and all this these different things. And so, once again, if you're young like Brian is, and you're doing it, the consequences are not going to be that painful. But if you do that when you're in retirement and you're utilizing this for retirement income, that's when the problems really start to compound against you. And that's the so anybody that here like Brian's talking about, oh, this works. OK, no, it doesn't. You've been in the business for five minutes and you talk like you're an expert and like, yes, you know a lot more about IULs than most agents, Brian. I will give you that. Um, uh, I can't see any comments if anybody's saying anything, but like, I, 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 I will give him that. But it's not infinite banking. Go read the infinite banking book before you start talking about it. I, like, I swear they just skip over that part. Um, I, la, 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 la. Okay, so he's talking about that. Uh, second year he did, he paid 5% loan rate and then 12% that year. Therefore, in two years, uh, positive spread 
of 17% over the loan rate. Uh, that once again, that's not the purpose. Uh, and anybody that's saying, here's the deal. I'm going to, I'm going to get off the screen share thing for a second. Anybody who's saying that IUL works for infinite banking and, you know, after four years having two examples where he made a little extra positive spread, which really is laughable, probably considering that 13% equated to maybe a couple thousand dollars of extra savings. But then you look at the long-term consequences of if it goes wrong in retirement, that's where the wheels come off. And what are the consequences of that? If the policy lapses, uh, if the po if you do uh, too, too much of a loan and the policy lapses before you're 75 or maybe 65 for uh, one company, um, depending on when you start leveraging it, then you don't have the overloan protection rider. And even if all the people that, you know, have been like, uh, there's one guy who's been like, oh, Chris, there's this one company that has an overloan protection rider instead of 75, it's 65. Well, first of all, I guarantee that loan comes at a cost being being that early. And secondly, if they're moving it up like that to, to prevent it, all the overloan protection rider does is it doesn't allow you to keep taking more money out of the policy. It simply means you don't get whacked with a massive tax bill. That's it. Like, there's not really any positive that comes from this overloan protection rider, like except for it avoids a big tax bill for you. But what happens if your your policy lapses and you have the overloan protection rider at 65? Now you got your whole retirement with no retirement income from this IUL that you're probably relying on if this and is that, what you put all your resources into. And that's what that's the pattern that I notice a lot of IUL agents. It's all about well, if like, what if these things happen, then you'll be okay. Mm -hmm. There's just a lot of what ifs, right? And I think yeah. a lot of clients when they buy it, had they known all those what ifs, I yeah. just don't think I don't see them buying a policy. And that's really the big problem. My son just got here. What's up? Uh, you just, just hanging out? To get away from <laughs> just getting away from the girls. He's just like he's overloaded with <laughs> estrogen in the house and he needed to come over here and hang out. So come on, take a seat. This is lots of fun. You're going to learn lots of stuff. Yay. Yay. So, yeah, I mean, you're right. And, and the thing, the thing about IUL is that what happens is you say what, have you ever played whack-a-mole? No. <laughs> you remember whack-a-mole growing up? Like you whack one mole down and then when you do the, oh other, yeah, 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 yeah. You squeeze, you yeah. whack and it pops up, pops up, pops up. Mm. Every time you whack one problem, like in whack-a-mole, like IUL is like, all right, here's the problem. And they go. You whack that problem. They go, oh, no, we got an answer for that problem. Bang, they do it. Well, then exactly that, the nature of whacking that mole down, it makes another problem pop up. It's kind of like a balloon. When you squeeze a balloon, it, that it's going to go out somewhere. The balloon's always going to find an issue, right? Like it's going to pop out. Of There's going to be a thing. And so like that, that's the problem is like uh, uh, the, the challenge that I see with IUL agents is that they're always trying to be like, Oh, I got a, I got a solution for that. You know, like, uh, Oh, overloan protection rider at 75. Well, I got a solution for that at 65. This guy had the, you know, this company will do it. So that solves that problem. Well, I guarantee you it comes at a cost and I guarantee you it doesn't really solve the problem because the real problem is the fact that these people don't have any money for the rest of their life. That's the real problem. Sure. The fact that maybe this one company did something to negate the, uh, taxable consequence. Okay. That's cool. Um, but with everything else, there's always uh, unintended consequences for people that they don't realize. And that, that's the problem. There are levers IUL companies can pull. And, and the nature of the design of the product is when they give you something, that something comes at a cost in return. And they're never going to give you, like, I always say this, how in the world, think about, think about this for people. If it's an, it's an insurance company, how in the world is this magical IUL product supposed to like give you better returns? Equal ish risk. People say it's a little more risk. No, it's a lot more risk, but, but they sell it as a little more risk. So how would they give you better returns? Just a little more risk. Um, you know, pay out much higher commissions, by the way, IULs pay way higher commissions. And, and everybody's like, Oh, you just not structuring them right. No, if you compare apples to apples, highly uh, properly structured liquid policies, whole life versus IUL, the base commission rates for target premium versus base commission rates for whole life base premium, uh, IUL pays 30%, 40% higher. So how are they going to pay more commissions? How are they going to give you better returns and do all this stuff without having more risk? It, they, 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 
you have to take that risk on. And as soon as you inject risk into your life insurance plan, that creates like, uh, to me, a discorrelation as to what the purpose of the plan is in the first place. Right. And I, I, I go through the lens of, and I'm always trying to make my decision through the process of what's the upside, what's mm -hmm. the downside, mm -hmm. can I live with the downside? And yeah. that's one of the reasons that I don't ever want to utilize a life insurance company as an right. investment vehicle, right? And, and that is the problem with IULs is that it's being sold as an investment alternative to 401ks, IRAs, stuff of that nature. And it's a piss poor one to boot, right? <laughs> it's life insurance should never be an investment alternative. It should be a savings alternative. And so when you start looking at savings, now you have to look at whole life because saving in an IUL is too risky. And so now you got to go over the whole life policy, you know, category. And when you start like, taking a look at, at, at that. Now, what do we want to do? We want to save money in a whole life policy or in, in, in a life insurance policy with whole life. And then when you take risk, you take risk outside of the policy and you leverage policy loans. And the reason whole life has to be the vehicle is because the results are predictable. The, mm -hmm. and the results in IUL are not predictable. And so when you use like, IUL for infinite banking and you try to do that or you use it, and let's say they're doing infinite banking and they're trying to do it for real estate. You're just injecting more risk into the real estate thing. You're the, the nature of using IUL is injecting more risk into the equation. Does it give you a little more upside potential? Absolutely. But it comes at a significant cost and risk. Right? right. And so you get more upside, but at a lot more risk. And that goes away from the infinite mm -hmm. banking concept. And that's why these people have to stop talking about damn positive spread potential, because that's not the purpose of the infinite banking concept. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? No. Yeah. no, he has no idea what I'm talking about. I think one of the things you always say, if it worked that well, the insurance carriers would do it themselves. Like sure. if it was that profitable and they can make that much money, why wouldn't they do it for themselves? Why wouldn't they have their own account where they can take yeah. all that money, but they don't because they yeah. know it's risk. Well, you know, that's, that's the thing. So let's, let's talk about that for a second. So, so, uh, these insurance carriers are, they're not dumb, right? They're probably the smartest financial institution <laughs> on the face of the earth. Right. And, and so let's just say, let's just say, um, uh, you have an opportunity, Matt, to, in, to, to invest in an IUL. And you, you could choose the S&P 500 index. And maybe that index comes with a 10% cap, 0% floor, and 100% participation rate. Let's just say that's, those are the metrics that we're dealing with, right? And so you, so, so it's fair to say that because of the fact that you're in the S&P 500, that they're, uh, what you're doing, well, let me, let me, let me say it this way. When, because of the fact that you're in the S&P 500, you are, basically participate in the index, not because you're buying the index, but because you're buying call options on the index. Okay. Right. So that S and P 500 result has a cost to it, right? Because you're buying the call options. So there's, you have your general fund budget, which is your, you know, the, the amount of uh, money in your policy that they're going to allocate to buy the call options. So you have your options budget, and then you have the cost of options. And because it's S and P, those options costs are going to be what they're going to be. What's happened now is all of a sudden these people are like, oh, now there's these new uncapped S&P 500 indexes, which allow people to talk about it completely differently and mislead. But at the end of the day, the input is still the same because you still have the same options budget, the same options cost. They may be able to illustrate it differently. And there may be years where it will perform better for sure. There's no doubt because of the way that works, but there's also going to be a significant cost on the back end. And people are not talking about that. The thing to understand is this is IUL is really simple to explain. It's a traditional UL with an option strategy attached to it. And all you have to do is understand what's the options budget, what are the options costs, and, and, and that's going to lead to a specific result. And purchasing these, these caps or purchasing an uncapped index is going to have a cost. And maybe it's the, the no risk rate is the cost. And maybe it's the 10 year treasury note. Maybe it's a spread charge. That's the cost. And typically with the uncapped indexes, they're using these examples because of during COVID and during the couple of years before we had these, you know, between 2019 and today, we had a couple of years with 20% returns, 15, 18, 19, 20% returns. And, and that, sure, that's going to look really good. 
But I don't know about you, Matt, but my background, I know uh, that is not the norm for the market. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. every other year that is a norm with a no risk rate of say five, five and a half percent, that's going to destroy the results. Not only that is we live in this economic environment where uh, there's a lot of uncertainty. Inflation is crazy. They're raising rates, you know, all this stuff that's going to put pressure on the S&P 500 and in increasing interest rate environments that makes the market perform worse, you know? Yeah. And so I don't know. I just, at the end of the day, it's all smoke and mirrors. And the way that the product is designed is to shift the risk from the insurance company onto you, the policy holder. That is it. And every element of the policy is designed to shift that risk from them to you. That's a fact. That's a fact. And there are different levers. The policies have evolved. The, the way that insurance companies have, have marketed them has evolved, but the principle doesn't change. It's, an, it's a universal life policy, which is a horrible chassis with an option strategy attached. And I don't care if they're doing a capped index and no capped index or you know a monkey index. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Like, the input and the outputs don't change. It's all marketing. It's all smoke and mirrors. And just as uh, Sean Gavin just said, the smoke and mirrors just like an illusion. That's what he said early in this meeting. I'm going to put it up there just for people to see. I don't know who Sean Gavin is, but he's a smart guy. And, you know, that's what it comes down to. And it's like that balloon. Whenever you squeeze a balloon, it's got to go somewhere. And the insurance company is, is the one in control. You cannot implement infinite banking unless you are in control of the results. The reason it works with whole life is because whole life is a contract that once you sign on the dotted line, you are a partner with the insurance company. You participate in the success of the insurance company and the yeah. insurance company, as long as you pay your premiums, is legally obligated to meet their promises to you. That's why infinite banking works with whole life insurance. With IUL, it's not about positive spread, people. Sorry about the motorcycles in the background. It's not about, they're getting fired up with me. It's not about positive spread. It's about the fact and the nature that when you put your money into an IUL policy, they hold the cards, they control the levers, and they turn you into a profit center for them. Because, and, and, and on the other end of the spectrum, they are not obligated to you for anything. And that's all I have to say. What say you? Well, I think, you know, a lot of agents, I, I laugh when I will agents, uh, they always say, well, it's, it's, it's how you structure it. It's, it has to be properly structured and I properly structure it. And I say, I understand that argument, but my argument is the concepts of how IULs work and mm -hmm. objectively, sure. if it was communicated to the client, I don't yeah. care how you structured it. They wouldn't buy it. That's all I got to say. Yeah, I mean, structure. Fact, I'll, I'll challenge anybody. Like, let me sit with your client. Yeah. And let structure. me ask them, would you go into a business partnership where they could change all the rules of the agreement? Nobody would right. even do that. Like, why would you even no, do that? Not. Like, just simple things, not. right? Yeah, I mean, structuring an IUL properly is like putting lip lipstick on a pig. At the end of the day, it's still a pig, you know? Um, there's 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 no getting around it. I mean, yeah, and I I, I, I say that all the time. It's like, you would never sign on the dotted line where you're putting all well and let me say it this way it's the hypocrisy behind it because they're all like get out of the 401k because you're in business with the government and the 401ks are awful because you're giving up control yeah. of your money when you right. do it with the iul yeah. you're just trading the government for the insurance company and for some reason all these iul agents are like hey listen the i the insurance companies are the most stable best companies in the financial history of the in the, in the world financial history they the, these insurance companies are the most stable companies with the most success and all these things guess what you're right and that's why you should use whole life because you participate with the success of those successful companies yeah. when you do it iul you are simply becoming a a profit center for them not a business partner and if you think that iul companies are going to give two dams about you and your policy and all that go back to the 80s and 90s and mid 90s and early 2000s when ul's that were sold in in 1980 1985 1990 that they looked really good for 10 to 15 years which is what's happening right now it's like those companies just let them fly out and what is an iul it's a ul with an option strategy attached attached to it they're illustrated way out of whack the costs get way out of whack. You control none of the levers. You cannot do infinite banking with an IUL because of the fact that you do not control the levers, A, and B, 
from a contractual perspective, the insurance company is not obligated to meet their promises to you above and beyond the guarantees. And while I don't think the guarantees are ever going to completely come into play, I do think it's a problem. And so you can't say infinite banking is just about the spreads because that's not the case at all. Yeah, I think it's just so crazy. I mean, even if you just read the illustration, like even if the clients just read the illustration, I read one from Transamerica the other day where it says the following illustration in bold, it says not likely to occur. And I'm just like, yeah. what is going on here? Yeah, for sure. For sure. You know, I mean, I guess I just got to get on a debate with this Brian Jarrell guy because he's he's the one who, you know, has been clapping a bit, a bit more than anybody. He's building a thing and like doing whatever. And I know he wants to debate. And I'll just debate him like at this point in time. Let's set up a debate. Let's set it up. I know I got to do a reaction to the last debate that he did with Michael still. I started doing it and then I moved and it was a little little wonky. So I, I got to go do that. But um, I don't know. What are your what are your and, thoughts? And, and, no, I, I would definitely I would I, I can set it up. And I, I think about that other IUL agent that you debated on your channel a while back. And what I notice is when you when you lay out the facts they're always trying to find some, some possible potential solution that maybe we could do it like this. And there's a couple of, couple of things wrong with this, right? So what well, we could probably jerry rig it and do this and then, then it will work. Right. So there's a couple mm -hmm. of problems with that. Yeah. Imagine you calling uh, your client, having them do something like that. Right. And they're going to question you like, what do you mean? What do we need to do? Right. Yeah. And that's going to be a problem with the client Two. Um, a lot of these IULs will have to be managed long term, right? And mm -hmm. what's the percentage of agents quit the industry? Over 90%. So now clients are buying a policy that has to be managed long term when there's a 90% chance the agent's going to quit. Like, it's just like, yeah. <laughs> it just doesn't even make sense, right? Well, I mean, think about it. The people that say, oh, you can manage these policies, like, if, if it takes that level of management to make these work, then you should have an equities license to be able to exactly. do it. You should have to that go through that level of training and nobody is. Like, exactly. and, and, and unless you are like an options expert and unless you understand all of the different elements of all these indexes, which these people do not know, I know that for a fact, they don't understand all the nuances of it. And every time, you know, I tell them to go watch uh, or read Life Product Review blog and like learn about it, from Bobby Samuelson, who's the best in the business at understanding and explaining it, they all just like, I think, go numb because they either they don't understand it or they don't want to yeah. acknowledge it because it kills their story, you know? Yeah, for sure. And so, you know, yeah, that's uh, I don't know, man. It's it's bad. I mean, let, let me do this. Let's 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 go back through some of these comments here. Um, I'm just kind of um, now. So oh, he wrote back to you. You wrote to him. Look at you. Look at you engage with him because there's a possibility doesn't make it a good idea that's true like it doesn't make it a good idea just the whole purpose of infinite banking is to eliminate possibility and inject like a positive guaranteed result like that is the purpose of infinite banking it's not just possibilities right uh so he's basically saying his clients are fully aware he's happy he'd be willing to bring 10 of his clients to a debate i bet you 10 of his clients are also on his team uh um, you know you know whatever internal if consumption be the same I fully explain the levers that an IUL can press. However, it's important to understand that the levers they uh, can pull versus the historical levers they have pulled. Uh, I care about actual results, you know, like the results of the industry, the class action suits that are settled and sealed in arbitration that nobody ever finds out about. The, the last year I, I left the company that I was with, the Fortune 1000 IUL company. It's one of the top IUL companies in the business. They had three lawsuits that were settled and sealed in arbitration that never become pop, uh, never become known about, that never get talked about. And these are the kinds of things that are happening all the time. It's a part of the business model of these companies. And then when you look at, like I said, Brian Gerald is learning from Doug Andrew. That is his like mentor, you know, is Doug Andrew. And so like, once again, Doug Andrew has had plenty of legal issues because of his policy designs and the policy's not performing, yet he shows all of a sudden one playlist with maybe 10 policies that have worked over his thousands of policy examples. And all of a sudden, like he's proven right uh, when there's like over a thousand people that have sued him uh, because of policies not performing. And like, 
I, it, the level of delusion is <laughs> mind numbing to me. Yeah. Like I just, the level of confirmation bias that these IUL mm -hmm. agents have to have mm -hmm. to just exist in this space and stay there. Yeah. It makes my head want to explode. Yeah. Um, any long-term IUL? Ha, has anybody seen any long-term policies set up for maximum cash value, like 20 or 30 years and how they actually perform? Not illustrated. Ah, oh, that's a good question. Mike and Melanie Breezy. Probably not as the IUL is a newer product and has been, hasn't been around uh, for a while, 30 years yet. It's been around for 27. I'm saying this. It has been around for 27 years. Why doesn't someone show uh, an illustration of 15 years funded with just 10 years of income? Just one. There you go. <laughs> Chris is officially in. I'm in. I'm in. I'm in the conversation. I'm Chris in. I'm in. Put me in, coach. In. Put me in. Oh, man. I seen one 21 years old. Somebody said he's been using the cash value to purchase properties over the last 10 years. Re recently set up for one for his daughter for, as a wedding gift. Other one that I've seen uh, a six year old policy that looked great. That's not great. Like, and once again, if he's using it for real estate, he's probably paying the loans back and whatever. That's, that's not using it for tax free income in retirement. Like, uh, like people talked about. Uh, and then Brian's getting back on here, man. I, I want to have an infinite banking debate with Brian of, about this because he just doesn't get it. All he talks about is the spread. Brian, you need to go read the bank, becoming your own banker book to understand that infinite banking is not just about a positive spread. Um, and just really, really, really set on that. IBC is, Hey, Michael. Is the concept talking about control your finance, uh, financial life as much as it is about positive arbitrage? When you understand this, then you'll understand the need, uh, why it needs to be whole life, which is a fixed and has guarantees. I will. You actually control none of the levers. Oh, whoa, this is a long comment. I'm not reading all that, Michael, but I'm sure it was awesome. <laughs> that was awesome. Uh, <laughs> Pablo. It's effing easy how ridiculous it is for people to get a license. That is true. Let's talk about that for a second. An industry that pretends to be noble and always do the best by clients should prevent golden retrievers from getting a license and putting people's money at risk. Note, I'm not going to say whether I condone or condemn this comment. I'll leave that part to interpretation. I agree with Pablo. It's way too yeah. easy to get a license. And for I sure. think it's way too easy for people to get a license to sell that product specifically, because one of mm -hmm. the things that I say, one of the things that I say a lot is that um, the different, the biggest difference with IUL and whole life is that I could sell you a mat. I could sell you an IUL. First of all, I could sell you a properly structured whole life policy and I could sell you a properly structured IUL policy. Don't mock me. And <laughs> if I sold you one of each, the whole life policy is going to work and there's no guarantee the IUL policy is going to work. That's right. two things. Right. Then I could sell you a, a, a base funded whole life policy, which would be considered improper. And I could sell you a, a target funded IUL policy. Okay. If I sell you a, a base policy, then the base policy, if we give it enough time, time is going to solve the problem with whole life. If I sell you a target funded policy with an IUL, time is going to make it worse and worse and worse and worse. Yeah. And so that on its own should just tell you about, you know, the basics of the difference between the two. Yeah, no, I mean, if you look at the securities industry, all that risk, right, you you have to get a securities license. There's a lot of disclaimers. And if you screw something up, I mean, you could lose your license. And it's just funny to think. Um, a simple life insurance license, you could have inexperienced agents say whatever they want to say. That's not even accurate. Sell IULs based on yeah. half truths, illusions, yeah. and they don't even know themselves. I'm just shocked that that is allowed to happen without yeah. uh, accountability, uh, disclaimers required by the agent to sign and the client. And the problem is the the um, insurance carriers, they put it all in the, the, the contract and the policy and say, well, it was there. You yeah, guys just didn't read it. Thing. And 
that's a big problem. That's the that that is the biggest problem is the insurance carriers are the biggest problem of this. And they allow the companies to get away with it. They allow the agents to get away with it. They allow this training and sales tactics to be done. And it's part of their model because there's so much profit in IUL um, that that they can they can afford to just hire these legal teams and do what they do and just allow it to go. And and listen, I'm going to say this. It's not to be I'm not saying this to say that there are not problems with whole life being missold right. and that there are no lawsuits with whole life or nothing of that nature, because there absolutely are. That is not what I'm trying to say. But if you look at them, uh, apples to apples, as far as the volume of lawsuits, it's not even in the same stratosphere. Right. You know? And so it's just important to know. So, all right. Anything else before we go? Nah, man. Next week, maybe I could bring another, another, uh, forum. We yeah, can just keep sending that. me crap and I'll get fired up and you know, we'll, we'll make this happen. I'll, I'll do my best to engage with this a little bit, um, you know, but like this is this Reach is out to Brian and, and set it up, set up the meeting. Talk to Brian, set it up for like maybe the second week of February. Let, let's okay. let's get it going. I've got I've got a lot going on here right now. We're renovating the hotel and doing a bunch of stuff and let's do uh, it. But it's all coming together. I got some room. I'm my studio is not ready yet. So I'm like literally here in in our lobby area, uh, you know, just doing videos and setting this up. And but it's it's working for now. Cool. We'll man. make it work. So, all right, brother. Well, all guys, right. if you hopefully you found value in this, if you did, if you have any questions, if you're an agent and you have questions, you want to talk to Matt about learning more about what it would be like to join our team, you can go down on the link in the description below. If you want to join a company that really focuses on pure education and not recruiting and anything of that nature, reach out to Matt. Uh, go down to agent.life180.com. Uh, and if you are in, if you're somebody who's maybe got an IUL uh, and you're looking for a second opinion, go to rescuemyiul.com. You can go to um, you can go to uh, life180.com forward slash clarity dash call. Uh, the link is in the description below as well. Set up a call with one of our one of our team members to uh, figure out what what a strategy utilizing life insurance as a savings vehicle, not an investment, can look like in your life. And that is it. Until next time, have a blessed, inspirational day. We'll talk soon. See ya.